I suppose that uh, we feel fear. When we have some sense of danger. <clears throat> and I guess by danger we mean the incipient possibility or reality of some kind of harm. suffering harm, or what seems like loss, or imagining having suffered harm, or suffering harm, or that we might suffer loss in the future, injury, illness, deprivation, inhibition, frustration, and isolation. And I think we associate harm with death without really knowing much about death. In fact, for most of the humans I've known, myself included, most of the topic of religion is actually about death. We might notice together that the stories about death, and the fear of death, and the attempted avoidance of contact with death, is an extreme religion. We're more religious about this than any other idea or concern. And not just in the sense of going to church or writing books about it. <coughs> in the sense of living it out. In other words, in the sense of translating our fears into realities by endless attempts to avoid them with thinking and planning and ideas, stories, rituals, ceremonies, repetitions of patterns in behavior and thinking, expectation, relation, or Sometimes the opposite of relation, dressed up like it. So, a lot of very intense attention, energy, concern is focused on avoidance of death. And I guess whatever we've managed to become alienated enough from to be frightened of. And part of my concern is that it was relatively easy as a child to be afraid of nighttime or the darkness. where the comforting experience of static identity, our visual familiarity with space and the meaning of shape and movement and form, all begins to dissolve into shadows and mystery, possibility, origin indistinctness, incompleteness. And at night we would sleep and dream. And in the morning 
we would awaken again, just as we still do, of course. So it strikes me that somehow the fear of death is actually ironic and strange and becomes for us while we are awake the fear of something else the fear of being born, the fear of coming to life the fear of dying to fictions and costumes the fear of dying to fears the fear of flying the fear of real liberation of actual intelligence the fear of the actual promise and wonder delicacy and beauty of our human origins and history experience and potential what we're really terrified of is coming to life. And something very strange happens when we fall asleep. And all the ancient cultures were deeply and profoundly aware of the metonymic relationship between dying and falling asleep. So they knew that something happened there was a great transformation at the gateway of sleep and across that gateway we would have experiences not less than our waking lives and thoughts orientations and ways of seeing but far more we would touch once again their origins and be thus renewed enlightened cleansed of clinging ghosts and fictions, fears and confusion, reoriented. And as I'm recording this, I'm watching raptors riding updrafts in spirals near a hilltop lit by the sun. And something like this happens when we fall asleep. It is as if our soul begins spiraling around a mountain. This is a very peculiar mountain. It's the mountain, the origins of life on earth, the history of our people, and the nature of the possibilities of our minds and being. And during this experience, we may have gentle, pre-dreaming-like sensations. And if we are conscious of the moment of transformation that often awakens us, we may feel a start or as if we've stepped off a stair into free space. Ordinarily, we're not conscious of the transformation that happens. But at some point in the spiraling, high above the mountain, the soul inverts its polarity. And rather than descending into thought and conception, personal identity, and language, concepts, what is known, It turns all that into wings and soars toward and into, as and for, its origins. Each night, each morning, the process inverts and we come back to conception and our human bodies and thinking, relationships, the physical world. 
what we call reality. I suppose dreaming is a frightening idea in some ways, for we cannot control it. And many people seek to have experiences of what they call lucid dreaming, in which they are aware within the dream. And this awareness often produces astonishing experiences and effects when it can be sustained. I think we've been taught to think about dreaming as a relatively trivial thing that happens when we rest. All of my experience and understanding is pretty much the inversion of that, that dreaming is the origin of our minds and intelligence and the possibilities of our existence while we're awake. And although I've had experiences of lucid dreaming, I'm much more interested to try to understand and experience and know what the waking corollary is. And I think it has something to do with death. Because when awake, it is as if there's a membrane I can push against, and if I push against it, I feel fear. It's a way of seeing. It's a membrane of, a, of the common way of seeing and thinking that I've been trained, even of speaking, but I've been trained by my experience of culture to express, relate as, think in and as. And when I begin to push against that membrane, I feel a kind of fear. And it's a fear that is at once exciting and confusing. It's the fear of the death or the interruption of fictions. These ideas and fictions, histories, identities, and such comprise a vehicle that we rec recreate and re-enter and preserve across sleeping and dreaming events and we're deeply identified with this vehicle and terrified somehow psychically that not, not that we would be threatened but that this construct would be threatened and so it turns out that almost all of our fears have nothing to do with anything real at all they have to do with the incipient threat of being divested of fictional identities and histories and stories and statuses with which our waking psyches and minds are deeply, profoundly identified. And the death of those fictions is birth to life. So it turns out to be very ironic. We're afraid of everything that is inhibiting us from being born while we are awake. By which, of course, I mean truly coming to life. Uh, as we often did, and we're quite familiar with as children. Um, so we're in a very peculiar position, not unlike the inversion of dreaming, which we might understand as an overly structured situation where many competing fictions and frameworks inhibit or co-opt our experiences of intimacy um, our own souls, intelligence, relation, and nature. And what we see in human behavior is also very interesting. We see people in their waking lives seeking experiences of um, extreme excitement 
or extreme forced engagement, um, po possibly death-defying activities such as bungee jumping or wingsuit diving, um, solo rock climbing, extreme martial arts. Uh, what we see during our waking lives is this incredible interest in extreme physical behavior that looks like playing with death but is actually really kind of its opposite. And then we also see a vast variety of interest in um, extreme experiences of sexuality, sexual enjoyment, or intoxication, uh, including psychedelic drugs, which all seem to aim at attempting um, to use expedience to gain an experience of the sudden divestment of fictional associations with the self and the mind and the soul. So that there's this incredible hunger everywhere uh, for the possibility of flight, but instead of its authentic sources and origins, we find in every place some kind of replacement, a waking world token that is supposed to represent what we might call ecstasis or rebirth. So people are attracted to various simulations or representations, intoxications, forgeries of freedom. Freedom from the construct they're so identified with as themselves and the fictional frameworks in which they have membership or identity, status, relational presence. And then we can look at the more terrifying uh, versions of this behavior briefly. We can see that economies are really killing, a way of killing everything and making that look like success for some while others die. War, uh, which is the armed expression of fictional constructs, fictional collectives, and they're usually almost completely invented uh, compulsions. And all of the other phenomena, violence, rape, suicide, um, terrifying injustice, masquerading as justice, and so on. And we see there's this bizarre irony in human existence, in our waking lives, that seems to have infected everything and be based almost entirely on fear and predation, domination, fictions, concepts, money, things like this. And those things actually destroy everything. Those are a kind of death from which rebirth is impossible. Um, those kinds of killing and death, while they do sometimes lead to regeneration or new opportunities, are terrifying counterfeits, terrifying errors that are completely unnecessary and have nothing to do with the, the imperatives that they seem to be focused upon. Now, of all these, suicide is among the more interesting of them uh, because in most cases what people are desperate for is not um, to physically die but to be reborn, um, to shed a trap that they're deeply and profoundly enmeshed in. And so even in the most desperate of human decisions, 
decisions oriented around suicide or murder, we often see at their root uh, a crisis of necessity. And I think we all feel some degree of this crisis uh, in many domains of our lives. The necessity of a liberation from having to live out fictions and identify and feel with and for or as or defend them and so on. So everyone's aching for something like flight and yet we tend to go kind of in the opposite direction or in a direction that produces an ironic opposite of our desire, uh, especially when our collectives are confused and unintelligent, um, cruel, domineering, and filled with propaganda, religion, and so on. The astonishing thing here is that what is more natural to our way of being human and intelligent is a process whereby our fictional identity is constantly being shed and dissolved and we are merging into uh, an intelligent and awe-filled experience of wonder and relation and learning. Uh, this is our nature and we return each night to dreaming partly in order to empower that possibility when we awaken. To have had a recent experience where all those things have nothing to do with who we are, and who we are becomes really deeply and emotionally relational, intimate, intelligently coexisting and emerging with all of the other beings and relationships. And this is the promise of our every day of human life. And it's what we are most aching for. In fact, compared to the deep experience of this, uh, neither thrill-seeking nor orgasm, war nor great research can compare at all. Yet in order to rediscover this, we have to find ways to both uh, hmm, catalyze and be willing to follow the process that allows our fictions to become transparent. So that we need not fear uh, their previous existence or history, but rather can even use that as fuel to exceed them. I feel fear very commonly. And even though I can say these things and know them, and, ex and I do explore them, it's still a great challenge for me, uh, personally, to find the path that transforms my fear into a door, a door that gives new birth to an aspect of my soul or humanity, existence in nature, and relation. But I have come to understand that my fears are like signals from something buried and that something's a bit like a seed. And it's as if there are two kinds of water I could use. One of the kinds hardens the seed and increases the fear and preserves its structure. And the other softens it. And as it softens a little bit, it becomes prone to sprout. And invariably what sprouts from seeds that I water with curiosity, wonder, um, questions, and uh, passionate seeking is that they turn into wings. 
And whenever that happens, I'm reborn in many ways, not one. I now have new ways of seeing and learning, being and relating, not just with myself, but also with others, with nature, with the origins of our minds and hearts, our humanity, our world, with the sky. The actual promise of our humanity is, is terrifyingly beautiful. It's so terrifyingly beautiful that it's relatively easy in the face of both the fears we have of harm and loss and fictional deprivation or real injury or illness, isolation. It's hard to see that these are invitations uh, to explore and retrieve something so astonishing, something so beautiful, and yet so incredibly ordinary, something that exceeds all of our hopes of adventure and heroism, something that is more brilliant, fulfilling, and true than the wildest experiences of thrill-seeking or even of sexual intimacy. That something is as clear and true as the light in our own eyes. There is no substitute. And behind the veil of fear, there is a kingdom of souls and minds, hearts and histories, far more astonishing and beautiful than all of our religion and all of our science. It is our home, it is our origin. We cannot but return there. If we shall do so even for a moment together while awake, I think we may find an entirely new way of relating with fear. A way that leads to liberation, understanding, mutual endowment and fulfillment a way of death to fictions that becomes birth to true humanity.